13 down to verse number 18. Proverbs chapter number 3, and we're going to read from verse 13 down to verse 18. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honour. Her ways are the ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Let us pray. Our Father, once again, we are thankful that we can be found in your presence. We are thankful, Lord, for the opportunity now of taking the Word of God and looking into it. We do pray now that you bless our time in the Scriptures. We pray that... Uh, we would be indeed encouraged and built up in the faith today. And Father, we thank you that you know us and you know our needs. And we pray, Lord, that you administer to us as only you can. So, Father, help us today, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In this uh, section that we've just read, uh, you can see quite clearly that there's a great emphasis placed upon the aspect of wisdom. And in fact, in verse 15, we're told that wisdom is precious. When you think of something that is precious, you, you obviously think of something that is valuable. And you think of something that isn't to be wasted, but you to grab it with both hands and to, uh, to hold on to it. And one of the ways, and I've mentioned this before, and I think it's a good thing to be mindful of, is that when you read through the book of Proverbs, one of the things that you want to keep at the forefront of your mind is that where the Bible speaks about wisdom, and it does speak about wisdom a great deal, is that we need to recognize that Christ is our wisdom. And it's pointing ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that really helps us to understand the book of Proverbs more clearly. Christ is the wisdom of Proverbs, and it helps us to, to see the great value of wisdom. So in 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1 and verse 24, the Apostle Paul wrote, Unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he, he certainly is precious, isn't he? Wisdom is precious, and Jesus is precious. And we considered this fact last Sunday evening, when we looked at the aspect as to how the blood of Jesus Christ is precious. That blood is precious because of whom it belonged to. And so this morning, once again, we can focus ourselves upon the Word of God and upon the wisdom of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is indeed the wisdom of God, and certainly say that He indeed is precious. And 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 says, and to you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. And so I trust he's precious to you today. I trust that you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus, and that you're leaning upon him, trusting upon him, and that he indeed is precious to your soul. The hymn says, Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, and without him. I would fall. So we have a few things we want to draw to our attention this morning in our text in Proverbs chapter 3. And the first thing that I would draw to your attention is the bliss of wisdom. The bliss of wisdom. So we see this in three verses. In the first part of verse 13, the first part of verse 17, and then in the second part of verse 18. And I'm just going to quote a, a portion from each of these verses. Verse 13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom. And then verse 17, her ways are the ways of pleasantness. And verse 18, happy is everyone that retaineth her. So what the Bible is telling us here is that there are a great deal of benefits to be had 
when you consider wisdom. And one of the, the benefits of wisdom is quite simply is that it brings happiness to your life. And the biblical understanding of, understanding of the word happy, because happy generally can be circumstantial. You, might, you may be happy because of something that you have or something that you've experienced, but a happiness in the world is fleeting. You know, when your circumstances change, then you don't have the happiness necessarily. But the happiness spoken of in the Bible is a blessedness. It speaks about a, a joy that isn't dependent upon circumstances. And it speaks about a, a bliss that is centered upon a person. So I'd like you to notice, if you would, a few things uh, about this bliss of wisdom. Because we see some words that are very interesting for us. Because it says, we have the word find in verse 13. And then it says that the ways of wisdom are pleasantness. And then in verse 18, it speaks about holding on to or retaining her. So these are three words that are quite interesting for us. Because while on the one hand, we understand that salvation is free. You know, there's not one thing that you have to do in order to be saved. There's not a work that you have to do. There's no money that you have to give. There's no document that you have to sign. There's no work that you could work your fingers to the bone. And you could try and be the very best person you could be. And that's not going to be enough for salvation. The only way that you can be saved is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died upon the cross, he died in your stead. All of your sins were laid upon him. He paid the penalty, he paid the price for your sins so that God could righteously and justly forgive you. So Jesus made the way possible that you could be saved. And when he died upon the cross, he said, it is finished. And there isn't a work that you need to do. There isn't a price that you need to pay. He did all the work. And he paid all of the price. So salvation is absolutely free. Nothing can be added to it. But once you have become a child of God, then what you do find, and this isn't a matter of reading the small print, as we would say, but what you do find is that there are certain things that are expected of us. And so what we find in our text this morning, that there are certain words that speak of what we have to do. So we don't do to get saved. It's already been done. But once you are saved, then there are things that you automatically want to do. So you could almost put it like this, that... If you want to enjoy true wisdom, if you want to enjoy the bliss of wisdom, then there are going to be certain things that you're going to have to do. So I'd like you to notice, you can even consider that these things are almost like conditions. In other words, if you do this, then you'll get that. And we understand this in many aspects of our lives, and we need to apply it to these spiritual truths as well. So he's saying there are certain things that need to exist, certain things that you need to do as a believer in order to enjoy these uh, conditions. So I'd like you to notice the first condition is quite simple. And, and these aren't great works that you have to do. They are so basic and so simple, but we often overlook these things. The first thing that you have to do is quite simply to find it. Isn't that great? Just, you know, if you want to have the bliss of wisdom, the first thing is quite simply is to find it. Now, you know, this world is looking for happiness, but in all of the wrong places. I think there might be a song like that. I'm not going to stop crooning like Brother Williams did or the other fellow. But, you know, there is a, there is a fact that in the world, people are looking for, for something. But the world really can never truly satisfy but we find in the Lord Jesus Christ that there is indeed wisdom to be had. So in verse 13, the Bible says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. You know, when you find something that is of great value, you know, you make it your business to, to get a hold of that thing, don't you? 
And so there's much in this life that people are looking for, searching for, but the thing that is the, the best thing to, to seek for has got to be this aspect of, of wisdom, finding wisdom. So wisdom is one of those things that you're not necessarily going to stumble upon. Now you might stumble upon, you know, cute and, and trite phrases about wisdom, but to find true wisdom in your life is something that you're going to have to be seeking for. And you'll find that wisdom is one of those things that will be discovered when you pursue it. And so the primary way we could say as a believer to have wisdom is going to be through the Word of God. And that's why so often I speak about the fact that you need to be reading the Bible. Read the Bible. Even if it's just a chapter or two a day, read the Bible. You know, the Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's got to be this aspect of seeking and trying to find uh, the wisdom, and you'll find it in the word of God. So if you would enjoy the bliss of wisdom, you've got to find it. And I'm telling you where to find it. You find it in the word of God. And then the other place where you can find it is just quite simply by asking for it. Isn't it wonderful that, you know, when you lack wisdom, the Bible says in the book of James that if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So you say, God, I need some wisdom. And God says, I'll give you wisdom. So, but you've got to seek it. You've got to seek it in his word, and you've got to seek it at the place of prayer. So you have to find it. In Proverbs chapter 4, I like again, sometimes you come across a more... Um, forthright way of saying things in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, he says, get wisdom, get understanding. So you need to find it. That's the first thing. And then the second thing that I'll draw to your attention is that once you find it, is you need to follow it. And this is what we see in the first part of verse 17. The Bible says, her ways are ways of pleasantness. Now, we, are, we do often come across different figures of speech in uh, the book of Proverbs. And here we have uh, personification where um, a, a personality is being ascribed to an inanimate object, as it is with wisdom. And wisdom is used of in the feminine. And that shouldn't cause us any alarm because in Hebrew it is quite common, quite, quite common to use words that would be either feminine or would be masculine. The important thing here isn't to be focusing on the her here, but upon the following here. This is what we need to understand. And we understand as to how people use, you know, um, this figure of speech of personification. Some of you know Ian and Cynthia Jameson, our friends who are ministering down in... Um, an uneaten way. And they were surprised. We had caught up with them after such a long time. And they were surprised with me and Tracy that we don't give our cars names. So, and I was surprised that they did. <laughs> so they had names for their cars, you know. So, uh, and we, some people do that. People talk of a car as a her. I wonder why they do that. Is it because they're so unpredictable and they give so much trouble? I'm not sure what it is. If we were to name our cars, and I'd say Tracy's is driving the black beast, and I'm driving the white knight, that's how we have to put the names to our cars, but we don't give our names, our cars names. Um, but the important thing, the important thing here isn't so much the matter of the her, but I'd like you to notice the important thing is the matter of the ways. And when you think about a way, a way is speaking about a well-known or a well-trodden path. And you know they say all roads are going to lead somewhere. So when you find wisdom, then you want to make sure that you're going to be found on the way, on the paths of wisdom, because it's going to lead you to pleasantness. You know, we live in a world today where there's so much uh, fighting and bickering and, and unhappiness but they haven't found wisdom and they haven't followed after wisdom in its ways. So 
So we, if you want to have a way that's going to lead to pleasantness, then you need to be following after wisdom. And then the third thing that I draw to your attention in the matter of the bliss of wisdom is the faithfulness of wisdom. Because once you have found wisdom, and once you're following after wisdom, then you need to retain or hold on to wisdom. In other words, you need to be faithful to it. So what God has shown you in His Word, and the things that you understand to, to be true and, and wholesome and wonderful, and the ways that lead to pleasantness, then you hold on to those things. You retain them. The Bible says, Hefty is everyone that retaineth her, keeps possession, holds on to those things. So we can think to ourselves now, how do I retain unto wisdom? How can I retain it? Well, you know, the greatest way to retain something is just to be reminded of things. And we, we often, uh, we forget things that are important. And so we need to be reminded of things from time to time. And I actually mentioned this last Sunday evening in 1 Peter, where it's, Peter speaks about how he reminded them of certain things. He said, though you know these things, but I'm going to stir you up by way of remembrance. I'm going to remind you. And to hold on to wisdom, to retain wisdom, you need to be reminded of certain things. And, and, and I'm mindful of the fact that when I preach or when I, when I teach, sometimes you know, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching something and I know you know it. But I know that you need to be reminded of it so that you can retain it. So if you would have the bliss of wisdom in your life, and this is talking to believers, people that have been born again, they're on their way to heaven, they know Christ is their saviour, and if you'd really have the bliss of wisdom, well, Solomon says you need to do this. You need to find it, you need to follow it, and then you need to be faithful to it, you need to retain it. You know the sad thing with Solomon, Solomon was the one who wrote the book of Proverbs, is that he didn't always practice what he preached. And he was somebody that found wisdom, and he followed wisdom, but he wasn't faithful to it to the very end. Because at the end of his life, he had all but forsaken wisdom. And his life was in, in a state of, of ruin, spiritually speaking. He had a, a gathered to himself a whole lot of things, but he had a lot of empty and vanity, emptiness and vanity in his life. And that's why you read in the book of Ecclesiastes as to how he speaks about life being just empty and vanity. It's because he didn't hold on to wisdom. So if you'd know the bliss of wisdom, dear believer, then, then you need to find it, you need to follow it, and you need to be faithful to it. And so it's an important aspect of our lives, the bliss of wisdom. Then the second thing that I brought to your attention is in verse 14 and 15, where we speak as to how, this is almost like what we're speaking about with the book of Hebrews, but this is the best of wisdom. Wisdom is better. And this is what we'll see in verse 14 and 15. Because we first see in verse 14 that wisdom is better than gain. Look at verse 14 if you would. He says, for the merchandise of it, in other words, of wisdom, the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. So when he speaks of merchandise, he's speaking about things that have been bought, things that have been sold. He's talking about profit that has been made. Now in this world, we're all seeking to make a business transaction and everybody wants to have a profit. But let me tell you this morning, there is no business transaction that will give you as much gain as what you can have when you have wisdom. Wisdom is something that is better than gain. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, the Bible says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. Now you think about that. To be a a partaker of the divine nature. And to those of you who are born again, to understand that you've been given these great, uh, uh, exceeding great and, and precious promises. These are far better than what you could have 
in pounds and pence, let me tell you. And then in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul said this, and he was amazed that God would use him so, but he said, And to me, this is verse 8 of chapter 3, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so we see here that the, the gains to be had from wisdom far, far outweigh any other gains that you could ever have. Many people think in terms like this, and I guess we have been conditioned to think like this, that the most important thing has to do with what we can gain materially or financially. But this is what Jesus said in Mark chapter 8 and verse 36. He said, For what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, you think of a person that is a, a mess to himself or herself a great deal of wealth. Maybe they, they have more money that, than what we could spend in ten lifetimes. But you know, when they die, do you know how much they leave? They leave it all. And... It's not necessarily wrong to be wealthy, but there is a tremendous danger to be wealthy at the expense of one's eternal soul. And so Solomon speaks about the wonderful gain that's to be had with wisdom. Money can buy a great deal of things, and there's nothing wrong with necessarily buying something. If you can afford it, then, then buy it. But, you know, you don't want to buy things and be so materialistic where by buying something you lose things that money cannot buy. So there needs to be a healthy balance in our lives. You know, we could say this, what is, what's the good of, having, of living in a mansion, the finest that money could buy, but there's no happy home? Uh, to be far, the, far better just to live in a, in a, in a small little space but where there's joy and there's peace and there's happiness. And we'll see this later on in the book of Proverbs again. So we see that wisdom is better than gold, or better than gain. It's better than silver, and it's better than gold. And then he, he goes on to say, in verse 15 as well, it says that wisdom is better than glamour, because he says she is more precious than rubies. Now when you think of of rubies or you think of diamonds you think of, of something that is bringing glamour to the wearer so a person might have a, a wonderful pendant or a, or a necklace or a, a brooch or a ring and it brings because of what it is it brings somewhat of glamour to the individual so while in some people glam glamour is highly desired but it's not even comparable to wisdom and this is how the Bible says we should consider uh, that which we're going to wear. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's wrong to wear jewellery. But in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 3 to verse 4, it gives us again a good balance to be had. He says, Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. You know, there's a great deal of emphasis placed on the external today. And the thing that's of great price to God is what's going on internally. So Solomon says, wisdom is better than gain, and wisdom is better than glamour. And then he also says that wisdom is better than gratification. Look at the, the second part of verse 15. He says, And all the things that thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. So what he's saying here, he says all the things that can be desired. If you were to have every need that you might want, any any desire that you might have, if you were to have that gratified, he says it's still not to be compared 
with wisdom. You'd, you'd fall far short in the deal if you were just living for a gratification of the flesh. And so Solomon says that wisdom is far better. It's better than gain, it's better than glamour, and it's better than gratification. That's the best of, of wisdom. But then lastly this morning in verses 16 to 18, I'd like to draw to your attention the benefits of wisdom. Verse 16 through to 18. He says, length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honour. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. So he speaks here about the benefits of wisdom. And there are four things that he mentions when he mentions the benefits of this wisdom. The first thing he mentions is the matter of time. In the first part of verse 16, he says, length of days is in her right hand. So what Solomon is saying is that wisdom has a tendency to give you length of days. But he's not just speaking about long life. He's talking about the, the quantity of your days, yes. But he's also talking about the quality of your days. And he says that wisdom is going to give you length of days in her right hand. It's interesting, the right hand you speak of strength. That's how it's normally used in the Bible. And I don't mean to be adverse to anyone who might be left-handed. But you know, generally speaking, it's right-handed, it's the strong hand. It speaks of deafness. It's in her right hand. And so if you follow after wisdom, if you have found it and are following and retaining wisdom, the, the results of it, the blessings and the benefits that come from it is a matter of quantity of days and the quality of your days. God's going to bless you. I know that there are exceptions, but this is, generally speaking, that's how God's going to bless. And then he speaks about treasures in the second part of verse 16. He says, in her left hand are riches and honour. You know the idea that you have from this? On the right hand, you've got length of days, blessings and honour in the left hand. Wisdom's hands are full if you would just but hold on to her because she is going to give you this wonderful blessing in your life. So it speaks about prosperity, riches, and it speaks about reputation. It speaks about honour. So God's going to bless. And it, let me, let me uh, again, you know my heart. You know that I'm no, in no ways any kind of a prosperity preacher. This is not what we do. I don't believe that is correct. But I do believe that God is no man's debtor and he's going to bless you. I like what David said. He said, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen, uh, I'm misquoting the verse slightly, I've never seen the children of God, you know, go without and begging bread. You know, God cares for his own. And let me tell you that when you hold on to wisdom and you, you find it and you retain it and you're following after it, you'll find that God's going to give you the wisdom that you need to go through life as you ought to. And you'll find that God is going to bless you with your time, uh, quality and quantity of days, and he's going to bless you in giving to you uh, riches and honour as well. And then notice if you would in verse 17, he says, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and the paths are paths of peace. So just to keep within the team, we've got time, we've got treasures, we've got tranquility. You know, there's such a wonderful thing about wisdom. It brings a certain amount of tranquility to a person's life. You know, people who don't know God, people who have no time for God in their life, the Bible says that the ways of peace they have not known. But when you know God, and when you seek to hold on to his wisdom, you'll find that there's a wonderful peace to be had. Paul said in the book of Philippians that we have a peace that passes all understanding. In other words, the world out there doesn't necessarily understand how and why we can enjoy this kind of a peace. But this is a peace that we have because we have found uh, a, a, a saviour in the one who is indeed the prince of peace. 
And then lastly, I'd like you to notice in verse 18, he speaks about wisdom being a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And it's interesting as to how, you know, in the Bible we have about 10 times where that tree of life is mentioned. And if you hold on to wisdom, you'll find that there's going to be this wonderful fruit that's going to be coming forth from this tree of life. You'll find salvation to your soul and you'll find sustenance for your life as you lay hold upon the tree of life. All other trees may satisfy for just a little bit of time and then it vanishes away. But what you have in Christ is something that will last for all eternity. So that from the tree of life we can say that her fruit should be gripped and should be held on to because it is indeed the path of blessedness. So what am I saying to you this morning? I'm saying to you this morning that wisdom is precious. There is so much in this world that people say, come and buy, come to me, I'll give you something that's going to make your life worthwhile. But all of those things are fleeting and they are worthless. But there is a wonderful blessing to be had if you find this wisdom that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're a believer this morning, if you know Jesus as your Saviour, then I want to encourage you with this, that you look at the Lord Jesus Christ and you recognise that He is your wisdom. You find Him, you follow Him, you're faithful to Him, and you'll find that God's going to bless you for that. And as you look at this wonderful wisdom that you have you'll see that it far exceeds what this world has to give you. This wisdom is better than any gain you could have, any kind of glamour that you could receive from this world, or any kind of gratification that sin could afford you. This wisdom is better. And when you lay hold upon this wisdom, you'll find that this wisdom gives you the wonderful blessings of time, of treasure, of tranquility, and of the tree of life. These are things that are great blessings to you. And so as a believer, I encourage you to lay hold upon wisdom. But I must just say, as we close our service this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, maybe you've been looking for love in all of the wrong places. Maybe this morning you've been looking for satisfaction. You want something that you can, that's really going to give your life meaning. Something that you can say, well, this is what it's all about. Maybe for the longest time you've been struggling under the guilt of sin and recognizing that there is a payday coming and one day you'll have to give an account. May I say to you this morning that if you come to the Lord Jesus Christ and you look to him, the one who died upon a cruel cross, the one who took your place and bore your sin, that you'll find satisfaction for your soul. You'll find somebody who's paid the penalty for your sin, made the way that you could be right with God, and you'll find somebody who will give to your life true meaning and true worth as you find wisdom. And so if God's speaking to your heart today, if you've never trusted Jesus to save you, would you speak to me after the service? And I'll be so glad to share with you from the Bible as to how you can be saved. But may we look to Jesus, the one who indeed is the wisdom of God. Let us pray. Our Father, we are so thankful this morning that we can spend some time in the Word of God and we're thankful, Lord, that we can be instructed in the ways of holiness.